All right. So good evening, everyone. My name is Natalie Stokes Peters, and um, I'm going to be your background co-host tonight. I've worked with uh, Black Classic Press for close to 20 years, and so it will be nice to be in the background and, and letting us have this fun conversation. Um, <clears throat> What I want to do is before I go further, I'm going to ask and make sure that everyone has muted themselves. The mute button is in the lower left hand corner. I think both if you're using your phone and if you're on a laptop. And so if everyone could please mute themselves uh, so that this can be an enjoyable experience for everybody. I'm going to say that first. The second thing I'm going to ask is that if you check the upper right hand button on your laptop, I think it's the same place on the phone. There's a view that's called speaker view. This is gonna be so much better of an experience for you because we're gonna be showing some artwork. If you put your phone on speaker view or your, your laptop, that will make sure that the person who's talking and what you're showing is gonna be right up there and it'll be nice and big so that you don't have to search for it. So those are the two things that I am going to say before I have um, Wangaza Bandeli clear the space and center us all. So Wangaza, Wangaza, just so you all know, is um, she always does libations for us and they're always so beautiful and I always want to cry <laughs> whenever she does them because they're <laughs> always so beautiful. And she also is the publisher of the Blacknificent newsletter. I think you all get those from us about once a month, usually a little bit later in the month. And um, she's the publisher of that newsletter. So she's the one who pulls together all that good black news. So Wangaza, the floor is yours. Thank you, Natalie. It is such a pleasure as always to join this circle, this place, this space that Black Classic Press creates um, ever so often. And so I want to just uh, help us to know and be connected to the energies that have joined us. And, and so, you know, it happens that today is actually uh, in a contradiction, Quasia died. It's a day in which our ancestors uh, from West Africa actually designated a day every 40 or so many days on the calendar to recognize our ancestors. And so we are, we are right and aligned with our traditions and calling forth all of the members of our village here today now as we celebrate the work of Winfred Rembert. And so I ask you uh, in this moment, using your own head and your own heart in whatever name you know God Almighty to call upon God, Odomankama, Tredeapon, Inyame, and then thank God for this day, because it ain't have to be this way. We are here, we are gathered, we are one in this circle. We call upon the great Abusun, the Orishas, the Lois, the great divine energies, however you know them, those who guide and protect us, known and unknown. And of course, we call upon the ancestors. We are completing our circle when we do this. We are calling forth those who have walked before us. We are recognizing those who have given us that which allowed us to be here today, whether we're talking about the money or the insight or the wherewithal, we thank you, we thank you. And so in this moment, from your head and your heart, I'd like you to just remember and call on the energy of your auntie, your grandfather, your uncle, your mama, your granddaddy, all them good people, great teachers, great artists, great publishers that had you to be in your right black mind to be here today. We do thank you. We do thank you. And of course, as we have come to celebrate and acknowledge Winfred Wimbert's work, we call Wimbert first. We thank you for all that you have given us and that Black Classic Press, Paul Coates, Natalie and the entire staff and supports have had the wherewithal to, to help us know and remember your spirit. This man who turned that chain gang pain into something like rain that we call art that was sprinkled into our lives and that nourished and rejuvenated us. Oh, we give thanks for your spirit, your work that sprouted new, new black life from the inside out. 
you, Winfred, who chose to use the skin, the leather of another as the medium by which black skin would be elevated and celebrated. We call upon that force, that spirit, that energy that you have personified and have left for us, that it will be magnified today, that your influence will be known beyond, that your medicine will be applied as you left it and as is needed. We thank you for that energy, that spirit that will be with us today as we get better, as we are more able because you walk this earth. We give thanks again and again. Amen. Thank you, Juan Gaza. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, it just really presences us for the conversation that we're going to have tonight. And, and that's, that's, it was just perfect and on time. So with that, let me um, go ahead and just for those of you, I, I think many of the people who are on the call are familiar with Black Classic Press, but just so that I do a snippet. Black Classic Press has been publishing books by, for, and about Black people now for 43 years. And not everybody is aware of the press, but let me tell you, there are some good books that BCP is publishing out there. Some of our books are books that were once in print and have since um, disappeared, and we bring them back into print so that we can have source documents. We can have the books where people actually wrote, you know, this is what I said, you know, John Henry Clark wrote this. Well, guess what? We're going to publish John Henry Clark so that you can see that. And so that's what Black Classic Press has been about doing. And we also publish newer titles as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But that's our specialty is bringing great book, great Black books back into print. Um, I would like to acknowledge a few of our special I just want to say our, our special guests tonight, they didn't ask to be acknowledged, but every time that we see them and for what they do in terms of supporting the press, um, they're always here. And one of those is Gail Hansberry. Gail Hansberry's um, father wrote a, well, he, he wrote some work and then we had um, Dr. Harris come in and do work after that. We just recently published two, two books um, with, with them. And that's uh, Gail Hansberry, who's on a, who's on as well. Zama Cook is an artist and Zama has worked with us on some of our book covers. And so Zama, I thank you for being on tonight. I think as an artist, this is especially uh, special for, for you. And I thank you for being here. We also have brother Tony Browder on. Um, Tony, I think you get to sit back and relax tonight. I don't think you have to <laughs> help us tonight, but Tom, Tony has often helped us when we've gotten into some questions or some things. And so he's just a, a beautiful brother. You can check out um, the work that he's doing. And, um, and Tony, if you would put that into the chat so everybody would have that. I also ask that um, if there are any book clubs who are present and on the call tonight, if you could drop your name into the chat, we would appreciate that. And if there's any booksellers who are on our call tonight, if you could also put your information in the chat, that would be great. Third, if you, we will be doing questions tonight, they won't be, you won't be asking them. What we ask is that you place those in there. We've got a team of folks who are, um, are going through and pulling those questions out. And so we'll have time for it a little bit later in the call, but please place your questions, your comments, your thoughts into the chat. And then we're gonna look to make sure that we try to get most of them in. We can't go all night, but we're gonna try to get a lot of your questions and comments in tonight. And so um, I don't think Troy uh, Johnson is in with us yet, but Troy Johnson is the owner founder of AALBC.com. And that was our, we'd like to thank him because he was our preferred bookseller for this book. So I'm hoping that many of you all went, you clicked on that link, you bought that book from Troy because that just helps continue to circulate our black dollars within the community. And that's so important. It may have been cheaper at Amazon, that's irrelevant. The point is let's keep our dollars circulating within the black community. And if it, that link will still be active. So you can always go back there. And then I think that um, 
Janine, one of our folks also has put a link on the side too for you to be able to click through and have a live link to do that. So um, I encourage everyone to get the book. I'm gonna tell you right now, I have it. This book was only $30, y'all. And I'm gonna tell you for a book that has this much beautiful color artwork in it at a high quality, $30 is really a good price, especially for a hardback book. So this is one uh, you'll be you'll be seeing more later, but this is a really good price. And so I think it's one of the ways that we're able to share um, um, Winfred's work. And so again, I encourage you all to go visit Troy's website or visit your local bookseller. If they are open, go visit them. If they got, if they got a phone number, you can place it call that store and get your book. So um, with that, I think that what I'm gonna do now, I'm just gonna introduce Paul Coates to you. Paul is the founder of Black Classic Press. He uh, is a native of, Phil of Philadelphia, PA. And um, he celebrated a nice birthday this year, y'all. <laughs> so I'll just say 25 years shy of 100 without telling his age. <laughs> It's a special year. So with that, I'm just going to introduce Paul. Anything else he wants to say about himself, he can. I'm going to go on mute. We're going to try to have fun tonight. And with that, Paul, the floor is yours. Hey, Nat, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay, Nat? Yes, we got you. Good, 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 good. So what Nat was getting to is, is this is year seven, five for Paul Coates, who's having a great time with it and um, who's going to have a great time tonight. So to um, move this along, because we, we have, uh, we have uh, I have a special guest with me who is hosting, and that's Malika Adero. Um, Malika is with, uh, right now, currently she works under Malika's Literary Tribe, but many of us know her and have known her for years as an astute editor, an astute publisher, a, a gifted writer and editor, and someone who I go to uh, frequently for advice around publishing. So when I was asked to do this, I, I knew that I wanted to do it because uh, Winfred's story is one of those stories that, yeah, it's about social justice and it's about the streets, it's about getting down, let's do this. But the art thing uh, kept coming back and I said, I need some backup. So I went to my girl because in addition to all those other things, Malaika is an astute art collector and an artist, astute art collector and artist herself in her own right. So Malaika is going to um, join me tonight and I'll ask Malaika to lead off as we bring in uh, actually the two people who we all are waiting to hear from. Um, we have with us uh, the author, uh, the co-author of Chasing me, um, um, if, if you'll bear with me for a minute, because I had some stuff written out, but the co-author of um, Chasing Me to My Grave, Aaron Kelly. And we have, in addition to Aaron, we have Winford's other half. I'm not going to deal with the widow stuff tonight, okay? We're going to deal with the other half. <laughs> we have Patsy Rimbert. And our discussion, Molly, you and I will, will guide the discussion, but our intention really is to have them voice an experience tonight that we all can be a part of. Hopefully, Aaron sharing about the book, the writing, what went into it, and things like that. And then Patsy grounding us in the experience of this great man that she helped she helped bring into being in the in an artistic way i would say if i can say that and if it's, if that's incorrect patsy please correct me um Malika, can i do this can i flip over to you and let you bring our guest in and uh, by asking where, where, wherever you want to start uh go ahead and start uh, folks on this call, I think you guys understand this is like a free form call and we're going we, to have fun tonight. We're going to make sure we got we got room in there for y'all to ask questions. OK, so you can get in with the dialogue. OK, Sister Kua. So we're going to make sure that. All right. 
so look, thank you guys. And, and Malika, if you could carry. Okay, okay. Well, let me begin by saying that um, I'm honored uh, to be invited and grateful to Paul for inviting me to this discussion um, with Patsy Rembert and Erin Kelly, um, who, who made this, this book happen. Um, the book is stunning, and so is the life story told here of Winfred Rembert um, and uh, the life of Patsy Rembert um, and the legacy that, that they together and, and, and separately have uh, created and which she carries on. So uh, I'm honored and, and, and welcome Patsy Rembert and Erin uh, Kelly uh, to this discussion. Thank you. How are you both? Okay. You're good. Yeah. So let me just say, um, Chasing Me to My Grave is, it's, to my mind, a book that is, is important in, in four ways. One, it's um, a story of social justice. Uh, that when, you know, when um, we talk about chain gang, when we talk about um, uh, segregation, when we talk about racial violence, racial terrorism in this country and the, and the, and the history of America, the shadow and the hard side of it is exemplified in the life and the work of Winfred Rembert. So it is that. It's, it's a movement story. Um, his life uh, is against the backdrop of the civil rights movement. He was a part of that movement uh, in, in a multi-dimensional way. Um, it's a love story between a black man and a black woman against this uh, um, backdrop, which we don't get enough nor appreciate enough for how key, as we say, it's become a cliche to say black love, but how crucial black love is uh, in the real sense um, as a tool of survival and actually, to my mind, uh, uh, a means to liberation. And then it is an artist's memoir. Uh, and, and one of the things that I'd, I'd love and, and I applaud um, the way Aaron put the book together, um, but I'm so grateful that, that the artist's process was included. Winfred Rembert talks very specifically about his process of making this art and the medium that he used, the leather, uh, uh, the pigments. Um, his style, and um, for someone like me who is a practitioner, nowhere near the, the brilliance and genius of this, it, it, it's, um, you know, I appreciate that very much. Art for me is, um, I use it as a process of healing and another way of, of expressing myself. Um, so I want to begin with, with Aaron, you know, when people see um, uh, as told to, you know, it can sound so nice and simple, like you sat down with uh, a Winfred Rembert, and then you sat down with uh, Patsy and, you know, had some nice hours of conversation and took notes and turned on a tape recorder and then just began typing. But I know in my heart, having uh, edited and written uh, these kinds of books uh, produced by this kind of collaboration, that it's a lot of work. Uh, and, and I'd appreciate you, Erin, talking about um, your process and why you signed on to do this book and, and, and what your other work is about. And that'll be a way of at once introducing you and introducing the book. Thank you. I, I'd love to talk about that. And I'm so happy to be here. Thanks a lot for inviting me. It's just such a thrill to be on this program with all of you and especially um, you and Paul and, my, and, and uh, Natalie. So thank you very much, Mylika. You're welcome. Um, so I'm a, a philosopher. I was doing some work on the philosophy of criminal justice, the ethics, ethical questions around the criminal justice system. I came across Winford's remarkable pictures of the chain gang of prisoners 
um, uh, based on his own experience. They were very striking to me. I was interested in the story behind the paintings. I had a chance to meet Winfred at McBlain Books in Hamden, Connecticut, which is down the street from where um, Patsy and Win Winfred live. Um, and um, and I, I talked to him about a little bit about the story behind his paintings of prisoners and got a taste of you know, his life experience and his incredible ability as a storyteller. Um, and I stayed in touch with him, visited him a couple of times and found out that he was looking for help in telling his story to write his story as a book. There were parts of his story that he had told through his artwork. He, there were parts of his story that he had told in public events, but he wanted to take his time and kind of work through important in, events in his life, experiences in his life. Um, and I was interested in hearing it. And um, I had some time to do that. And we couldn't find anyone better at the time. And Winfred was not well. So it seemed important to start the project. Um, so I went to Winfred and Patsy's house and um, turned my tape recorders on and asked him what he wanted to talk about, where he wanted to start, and where he wanted to go with the story. And I tried to go into it with a very kind of open agenda so that I could follow Winfred. I could listen to Winfred. I told Winfred, take your time to tell the story you want to tell. And then I would um, take my tapes home, transcribe various parts of them that seemed especially compelling, arrange them, and then go back and read them out loud to Winfred. And we'd talk about them again. And he would think of more things he wanted to add. He would reflect more on what we had already talked about. And then we would add more bits and pieces into the story. I would write it up again, come back and read it. So there was a lot of reading out loud reading, which was a really interesting process to hear the story you know, to read the story out loud that that as I had written it down and have Winfred respond to it and then just to take it step by step to see where he wanted to go with it. Um, and of course, Patsy's voice was became it became obvious that Patsy's voice was going to be very important for the book, too, and that her presence in Winfred's life was um, really astounding and interesting and worth concentrating on. So, um, so I talked with Patsy and sometimes she talked with the two of us and you know, there were just many really moving conversations, sometimes um, a lot of fun, you know, laughing, telling stories, other times very painful things that Winford talked about um, where I really tried to listen as carefully I could, as I could and understand. Um, what he was saying and ask him, you know, to, to talk more about some of these very painful things. Um, so that was our process. It went on for about two years until the pandemic shut down our in-person meetings. And then we continued, you know, kind of cleaning up bits and pieces over the phone, but we had really finished most of the interviews about the main things he wanted to talk about. And at that point we were refining and polishing. Great, thank you, thank you. Patsy Rembert, um, again, welcome. Uh, you do have a voice, you are a contributor to this book as well as uh, a partner in life to, to Winfred. Um, did participating in the book in this way, having uh, your direct voice in it, did you have to be convinced about that? Did you have to be talked into it or were you uh, excited to do that? I didn't know that I was going to be that much of a part in the book, but um, I didn't need to be convinced because I want to talk about him. And that's why I could talk about him so well, is because I, it's so much more to the man than what's being done now. But I was happy to put in any little thing that I could put in that would uh, enable him to have his story told because his, his story is not just about him. It's about the lives of how young black men had to carry on and how they had to live in that time. Right, right. Well, can you talk about the time? Um, tell us um, how long you were together and, and what time period it was when you two first met. Well, we've known each other for 50 years, but... Um, It was a secret. He was a secret. So it was about 
four and a half years before we actually could be together after I met him. But uh, Winfred was just interested to me. He was interested in uh, the things that I learned about him later made him more interested. But uh, our life together was up and down, good times and bad times. But he was struggling through life, maneuvering himself between the jail and safety and free and a family. And we had a family right away. So things was tough for him, but he, he seemed to be able to maneuver himself around the hard times and still make it fun. You sure did. Um, you, you talk about it in the book, but um, tell us here um, the circumstances under which you met. How did you first see and encounter Winfred? I saw him on the back of the truck, and uh, I just thought he was the most handsomest guy I had ever seen. And uh, I, I told my mom that I saw someone, and she said, well... He's on the chain gang. It was no way that I was going to be able to meet him. But Wilford walked up into my yard, actually, and I was washing clothes the old fashioned way with a rope boat and in a tin tub. And I ran from him. I ran in the house and told my father that uh, it was a prisoner in the yard. My dad came to the door with his shotgun and he looked out, he said, what you want? He said, what was said to him, he said, oh, we just want some water. I just come and get some water. And my mother saw him and being the kind of person she was, she said, y'all working down there? He explained that uh, he was working on the bridge below our house. And uh, she said, well, come up here at 12 and I have y'all some dinner. And she fixed him a big, big plate of fish and uh, iced tea. And uh, from that point on, we, but they didn't know it. He was a secret. He was definitely a secret. He um, first got my attention by stopping my school bus. And he would stop it by piling dirt up in the middle of the road. And he would go around the bus, right, the girl, come on, right, the girl, right. And I wouldn't say nothing. But so finally he wrote me and that was the kicker. I got his letter and I just, I was fascinated with what all he had to say. So I wanted to hear more. And actually I fell in love with his writing before I did him, I think. And just Talk about, now what kind of writing was it? Talk about that a little bit. Love letters, just writing things about what we were going to do if I agreed to be his wife. He never said uh, what I could do or what he would do. He always said what we could do. So he included me in his plan. So that was the fascinating thing that I found. But he was, you know how the story go with uh, uh, Cinderella? Mm -hmm, yeah. I, I had lost my slip and he found it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he was to me. And I would, um, how would I get to go to see him I would go over and uh, comb my grandmother's hair, braid it, and I'd ask her, can I go to the store? And she said, yes, baby, you can go to the store. Bring me a knee-high bag. That's a knee-high orange soda. So I would go up to the store, go all the way down the road and cut across and come down to the camp to see him. I got caught. <laughs> <laughs> he had went on for a while. And... Uh, after getting caught, my board that was coming to see me, you know, at this time, let me explain. I had what you call suitors. And my father didn't allow us to date one boy. He wanted us to have a variety of boys to come around so we could choose who we truly wanted to be with. He felt like if you got hooked up with one boy, then you'll see somebody you really want. So he would uh, allow us to have a uh, a lot of different boys could call on us. Wasn't taking us no place, but they could come, <laughs> sit and talk. Yes. But um, Wimple couldn't come to see me. So no one knew about him, but when my 
former boyfriend at this time come over to pick me up from my grandmother's house, he caught me going to the camp. And he tried to persuade me to get in the truck and I wouldn't. So he went back and told my parents and that's how they found out. And it was difficult for me for a while because I wasn't allowed to talk to him or write him or receive letters from him anymore once they found it out. So their objection was because he was on the chain gang. Was that the problem? That was the problem. My father said, oh, once he caught me, he said, how could you stoop so low mm. to date and go and sneak and see him? He said, I'd rather see you dead. And he told me I could not write him, but he intercepted a letter that Wilford wrote. Then he took me. After reading that one letter, he took me to see him. And I didn't know that he was taking me. And then when I realized he was going to the camp, I thought he was going to do something to it. But he wanted to talk with me. And after talking with him, he what was said, uh, he told me, but he said, now I know them little houses. I don't want you to take my daughter in there. He said, but I'll let her come see you. And you treat her with respect. And we'll say, yes, sir. And that's how I will coach ship. I could go out on Sunday then and see him. But the most of the time after that, he got shipped away so we could only write each other. And from the letters, and he got out in 74, we got married in 74. Oh, okay. We tried to marry the day he got out. That didn't come out too good. Got to have all these paperwork, blood tests. We couldn't get it done. But he come back in uh, December of 74. And he walked in the room. I don't know whether I should be talking about all this stuff. <laughs> but he walked in. He, he come in the house and he come in the room where I was picking up what other guys owed my mom. And he said, what do I owe? And I didn't catch his voice at first. And then he said, I said, what do I owe? And I caught his voice. I thought the paper, the book, everything away. I don't know where it went. <laughs> and I grabbed him. And we got married that December 25th. But um, it was, our coach, it was unusual and amazing all at the same time. Because it was done through letters. I didn't really get to go any place with Wilford until after we married. But I, I, I loved his talk. I loved his letters. I loved his mannerism. I loved his outlook on life and what he wanted to achieve and what he thought he could achieve. I was looking for profit. I was looking for a mate and I found it in him. And one of the wonderful aspects of this book is that the letters are there. Some of the letters are there. So we, we get to actually <laughs> read them. They, they you, are get, you, you get a chance to see how he, I told him he took advantage of me though. I was on the 17th of the year and uh, his letters was overpowering for a young girl <laughs> of my age and maturity. I said, you took advantage of me. But he was just so charming. That's the best way I can describe him. He was charming. And he charmed me and my parents. I, I got to I gotta cut in because we were talking about this earlier today. And I was reading the letter. And I said, oh, my gosh. I said, I can't believe they agreed to let this letter go in the book. <laughs> it's not hot and steamy. But to hear, <laughs> to hear this man... You know, talking about like, like how 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 much he loved her, and he says, "When we we he says, I love you, and we are lovers. I'm gonna hold on to you forever and ever. I pray for us every night that we can soon be together for good. I often think of what it's going to be like when we are married and in a house of our own and living on our own rules. And I'm going, they have, they put this letter in the book. I thought it's very vulnerable." <laughs> For him to allow that to be in there as a man, you know, it's like men don't usually want their love letters exposed. Oh my God, he got so many. <laughs> and I have them all. 
Well, you talk about being 17. I'm a little bit more than 17. And if somebody wrote me a letter like that, you know, I would, I would give them some attention back too. <laughs> you know. Uh, and and the, the, the love affair is, is expressed and documented through his, his paintings. Paul, I think you, you were struck by that. Can, can, can I say something while we're still on the letters? Uh, because, um, you know, Patsy, I hear what you say, he took advantage of you. <laughs> but one of the most impressive letters to me is when y'all are really, really having hard times, and my man is in jail and he said, look, no, you got to go find somebody else. You got to go do something else. I swear it's like a 70s or a 60s ballad. You write that man back and you say, it's, it's like Jennifer Holiday or somebody on Dream Girl. You say, uh-uh, <laughs> ain't no way that's happening. You know, I mean, you, you talk about how even after being married and having five kids for that man to walk in the room and, and to even look at you, it made yes. you feel like he was still 17 years old. I, yes. I mean, look, so Natalie can say whatever she wants to say about a man and all like this. I'm going to tell you, that, that, that was a hot letter, okay? <laughs> That was a, your, your, his was longer, yours was short and compact. You say, uh-uh, that ain't even that. I'm going to be right here when you come out. And that's what you did. Yeah. That's what you did. That's what makes it so powerful. And, and I know Molly, do you? Uh, Paul, you just muted yourself. Paul, you just muted yourself. I'm sorry. As much as anything, um, and Aaron, again, I thank you so much for allowing them, their voices to be heard. As much as anything, this book is about art, but it really also is about relationships. And at the center of that is this relationship between this black man and this black woman going through hard times, going through good times and hard times too, all the way. And coming to the place now that we can celebrate the man who you held up. The man who you recognized that there was something in him before anybody ever saw that. You recognize that. And I'm, I'm going to stop there because Molly Egan's doing a great job. But I, I had to get the shout out into the sister. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. That, that, that uh, fits right in with the, the flow of things because the, the same kind of passion um, revealed in this relationship is the same kind of passion that's express, expressed in. Um, Winfred's artwork in his uh, uh, in his paintings, uh, you know, as as is said in the book, you know, when I looked at it, I thought um, Jacob Lawrence, you know, Romare Beard and Faith Ringgold, um, the African American artist who elevated um, our most difficult stories, you know, to levels uh, of beauty while um, becoming the record of what happened to us and what happened um, um, to, to Rembert. That I also like that, you know, his, his work evolved from, uh, um, from craft. You know, everybody knows about leather work and, those hand tooled wallets and handbags, you know, that are, are part of American handicraft. And he uh, elevated that to, to, to find art. And uh, uh, I think Pat, Patsy played a role also in that, you know what I mean? You know, uh, maybe he uh, would have kept on just putting the artwork on handbags and, and wallets and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but Patsy, did you have something to do with him uh, using the leather as a canvas? Yes, I, I tell them nobody else was doing that. They do everything else, but they, they haven't put pictures and stories of, I see you'd be the only person doing this. And it's made him think, maybe I ought to try it. And he was trying to figure out what to do with the leather because pocketbooks and stuff wasn't making much money. So when uh, he found out that uh, people would actually buy a picture, 
that he did on leather and nobody else was doing it. Right. Nobody else was doing pictures that I knew of and I, the stories that he was telling around the table because that's when we talked. He hadn't went in depth with his story telling at the table, but I thought it was interesting enough for him to put them on paper and then put them on his leather. And uh, because he was always doodling and drawing something. Uh, we go to the PTA meeting, he'd draw to somebody he disagreed with, he'd draw them and make them ugly. Uh, you know, and they thought he was taking notes and I'd say, he was mad. I knew what he was doing. They thought he was taking notes, but he was drawing them. And so I see you can take some of that talent and, you know, he said, oh, nobody want to buy nothing I'm doing. I see you don't know until you try. And finally, one day he did. He wanted to give Sharon and he said, you know what, I'm going to make a picture and I'm going to give it to Phil for Christmas, him and Sharon. I said, well, that'll be a good idea. Anything to get him to do it so he could see it for himself. It's nothing like seeing something yourself to uh, convince you. So once he did it, he liked what he had done. Still didn't have no idea nobody would want to buy it. Phil hung it up in the store. Somebody wanted it and bought it. Now he was good to go. <laughs> once they bought that picture, he said, mm, maybe you got something. <laughs> and he started doing pictures of his life so that they would be captured forever. That was my whole thing. Nobody's gonna know about it if you don't write about it. Mm, right, exactly. And, and talk a little bit about how he learned that skill. Where, where did he learn how to work with leather in that way? And then Malaika, if we could go in and have, because we've been talking about this artwork. And so if we could have after that, or somewhere in there, have Aaron show a couple of pieces um, for us, I think that'd be good. Perfect. Well, he learned it when he was on the chain gang. He learned it from a guy he called TJ. I think it was TJ. And uh, after he learned how to do it, the guy got jealous and, and wouldn't help, wouldn't let him do it anymore. So he made his own tools and kept making pocketbooks on his own. Okay. So that's, he's a determined person. He was determined. If he wanted to do something, he would do it. Yes. He would do it. Aaron, are there any, do you have any thoughts or anything you'd like to say, you know, segueing into the show? Well, I could show um, an example of several different themes in his work that, um, that, you know, he, that go into the book in a, in a, in a big way. I mean, one of the things that's so exciting about the book is the interaction between his artwork and his storytelling. Each of these paintings is, uh, has a story behind it and he tells those stories in the book. So let's see, let me, let me just start at the beginning, which is uh, a painting called The Beginning. And again, you all wanna have your, your view set on speaker view for these, they're just beautiful. So this is a picture of, whoops, sorry. Um, this is a picture of Winfred. Let's stop the slideshow. Why is it going you? Uh, oh, whoops, no, I don't want that. I want enter full screen, sorry, view full screen. Okay, so this is a picture of Winfred as a baby being given by his birth mother mm -hmm. to his great aunt who raised him. It was a very, um, painful theme for him in his life to come to reckon with his mother having relinquished him. And the book opens with his thoughts about um, his mother and the impact on him of his of, of impact on his life of her decision to give him up. Um, Patsy may want to talk about that a little bit more, but um, you can see that um, texture of the leather um, and that's Winfred, the little little baby. Um, so I chose this painting as one of the cotton field paintings because it's Patsy's favorite painting, I believe. Is that right, Patsy? Yes, it um, is. I so <laughs> Winfred painted a lot of paintings of the cotton fields where he worked as a child uh, together with his great aunt, who he called Mama. 
Um, these are really striking paintings because they're so beautiful, but the subject matter um, was really difficult. It was about, you know, very difficult um, work that Winford didn't want to do, that people felt forced to do. Um, and so he talks about the experience of working in the cotton fields, how difficult it was, and at the same time producing these amazing works of beauty about these scenes um, that were so impactful on his young life. Um, so this is another cotton fields picture, and you can see the overseer there, um, um, you know, pushing people to work harder. Um, and here's another uh, another picture of the cotton fields called From Caint to Caint. You can't see when you start working and you can't see when you're done working. It's dark. It was a long day. So this is called Caint to Caint. Um, and then this is a picture of um, Cuthbert, Georgia, the main street in Cuthbert, Georgia that went, ran through the black neighborhood, which was a very exciting, wonderful place for Winford when he finally got out of the cotton fields ran away to Cuthbert, Georgia and began to meet people um, who had businesses there, who frequented the juke joints and the pool halls. And um, he discovered this, the, the life in the black community of Cuthbert, um, which brought him great joy throughout his whole life. I think it was one of the things that when he was in prison, he could think about and it would nourish him. These were very important memories, the people and places um, where he felt a sense of community and support um, and love. Um, this is a pool hall where um, Winfred um, went to play pool and eat meals and meet people. Um, and here's a, a picture of the Dirty Spoon Cafe, which was one of the juke joints where people would gather, um, dance, have a good time. They wore colorful, very colorful clothes. Winfred learned how to dance. Um, he really celebrated these moments of his um, young teenage life um, when he, he discovered these places in Cuthbert. Um, another scene from a juke joint, people dancing, live music. Um, he knew uh, the people who played the music in the band. This is Ben Shorter's band. Um, the next sort of set of chapters in the book, really the maybe the second segment of the book, um, was uh, the story of Winfred uh, becoming being being arrested after the civil after participating in a civil rights demonstration, um, jailed, um, beaten by a deputy in jail. He ends up escaping from jail um, and is uh, rearrested and nearly lynched by a group of um, white men, put back in prison, um, and sentenced to 27 years. Um, so he, he writes, he, he, he talks a lot about in the book about um, the significance of his prison experience and paints these amazing pictures, um, which Patsy may want to tell you a little bit more about what they mean. But, um, but this is a picture called All Me, which um, is, represents, um, jump in Pat, Patsy if you want to add something, but represents all the different personas that Winfred had to take on in prison, which was a very brutal place in order to survive the brutality um, and hardship of that experience. You wanna add anything that to Patsy? Patsy? Yeah, he said that he felt like he had to be this many people to get done what they was asking of him to do. So all the people that you see in this picture is him and he's doing all of these things and it's just him. Yeah. That's him doing all of the chores and all the demands that they was making of him. Yeah, the demands were very harsh. There were sometimes really um, forms of torture that he had to go through. Um, prison With camps. Um, and yes, he, it was, um, it, it was, it was, it was a, there was a lot of suffering that he had to cope with in some way. And he kind of fragmented in his mind, his own sense of self. And then later in life reunified, you know, his, his um, these different moments in his of, of pain in order to make a beautiful work of art about what he'd been through. Um, okay, and here's um, another chain gang uh, painting called All Me on the same theme. Um, and Winfred, self-portrait as a prisoner. Um, 
And we come to a scene that Patsy described a few minutes ago um, in her yard. Patsy, can you just tell us a little bit about what's going on here? Yeah, well, he got me washing clothes in the tub and my mother is pushing them down in the pot. I don't know whether they know about that, but you had to boil your clothes too. And my sisters kept hanging this stuff on. There's chickens in the yards. I had, we had all this stuff. And there's a well where we had to go draw the water from. And uh, my father sitting there and start shopping the ax. So that was a scene of my yard. That was the scene of my yard. And there's the dog in the background. But uh, this is pretty much how my yard looked at the time when I met Winfrey. Right. Okay, and here's a picture on, I think your wedding day, is that right? The day before. The day before. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh my God. That was a beautiful day. You know, everything I have on, he bought before he came. He brought that for me for a Christmas present. I don't know how he knew how to pick my size, but he got it. And uh, he wanted me to put that on and we stood out in the road. My house was a little ragged. So we stood out in the road and we took a picture of the fence line. And now there's another picture of us after we after 40 years, we took another picture standing in the middle of that dirt road. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's the day before, two, no, yeah, the day before we got married, that picture. All what right. year was that? It, it could be now, you're very stylish, you know, but what yes. year was that? 74. Okay. 74, December the 23rd, yeah, 23rd. So I'll show you a couple. No, it wasn't December the 23rd. It was December. Don't ask me the date because I don't forgot. <laughs> I forgot the date. But right. I go back to when well, I knew what happened, the scenes. Oh, my Lord. So here's a picture that Winfred um, painted of Winfred and Patsy. I love uh, that picture. He did that picture because I told him I love the way that in the newspaper, he had a, a look of, of distinguishing that he had something on his mind and he was telling his story. Finally, somebody believed him. That's the look he had. Wow, very cool. So I'll just show you a couple more. Here's another picture of Winfred and Patsy, the we first did. dance. <laughs> yeah. That's not early. And then finally, I want Patsy to tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. this person. That's my mom, Sugar Kay. I wanted to be her. I didn't want to just look like her. I wanted to be her. She had so much charisma about herself when she dressed for church, you know, or when she dressed to go somewhere. She had everybody's attention. <laughs> they watch her. And not to be an educated woman, you wouldn't know it because she had a sense of style about herself that this says, oh, I'm somebody. Take notice. I just thought she was a beautiful person. I think Winfred thought so too. He yeah. speaks about her very lovingly in the book yeah. with a wonderful description. And she could cook anything, anywhere, anytime. <laughs> I'm telling you, she was a terrific cook. So uh, Thank that you, gives you what? Thank you for showing my mom. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. I love that painting. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. And the story about your family and Winfred is really was so moving to me to hear and uh, to have it in the book is just is just wonderful. Mm. So that gives you a little sense of some of the themes in, in his artwork and also important moments in his life. Thank there you. was um, one other talent that um, Winfred had that uh, I'd like for you to speak on um, um, 
Patsy and that's he had a good singing voice. Oh here. my God, yes. And I didn't know it until after we was married. I didn't know he could sing. That was a bonus. <laughs> I didn't know he could sing. And that's the way he would get out of trouble with me. He'd start singing. Oh. And I, I would stop being angry, but I would pretend that I'm still angry in order for him to keep singing. <laughs> but uh, he had a beautiful voice. And uh, he sounds similar to Johnny Taylor or, uh, or Sam Cooke. He could sound uh, a more like Johnny Taylor, but um, sing gospel. Mm. And he also sang R&B type songs. But he, is, he had been in two, had been offered to sing with the Soul Stirrers. But we had just recently got married. Yeah, they thought he had a beautiful voice. And uh, he told them, well, I just got married and I'm, Starting a family, I don't want to leave my wife. So he wouldn't go. He said, they on the road too much, honey. Because I want them to do it. He said, no, they on the road, they everywhere. He said, no, I can't do that and be your husband. So he wouldn't go. But they tried to get me so with the blind boys for a couple of times when they come through New Haven, he would sing with them. Or Bridgeport, he would sing with them. And uh, he was in several groups that he started. One was the Messengers, one was the Bells of Joy. And uh, he, he just, he had a beautiful voice, beautiful voice that captivated other people that loved to hear him. He had, a, he had a following. If they knew he was singing somewhere, it was coming. Okay. And they, they would come mm. just to hear him sing. Paul, you've been quiet, but I know in some of our early discussions about this, you were in many different places about Winfred. You were in different places. You told me you cried about something, and <laughs> I told you I would tell <laughs> that you cried. So you want to you want to kick in here a little bit? So I, do, I do not, but you know what I really want to do. Also, I want to um, ask if we can move this up a bit and um, begin taking questions because I'm watching as the questions are coming in. And all I want to do is be selfish, okay? <laughs> I really, really want to be selfish because, and, and I'm going to get to what you're saying, but I, I keep going back. Patsy is the remarkable um, element so much in this story, and Winfred knew that. Because in the book, he's just saying it over and over and over. I don't, I don't know how many paragraphs he get through without saying Patsy. <laughs> you know? I, mean, I don't think there's a page, and Aaron, you can tell me because you wrote it. I don't know that there's a page in the book that don't say Patsy. <laughs> <laughs> that man knew what he had. I, I understood what you were saying, Patsy, earlier about y'all have ups and downs and there's rough this, rough that. I got that. I understand. But that man knew what he had on any good day. He knew what he had, okay? <laughs> and I think um, um, the, 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 uh, a telling part about this is his willingness to be vulnerable and to share from the inside. One of the things is, this is not a book. When, when you guys get, if you haven't got the book already, when you get this book, do not be mistaken. This is not the story of somebody that just went to the chain gang, okay, and, and had a hard life, and then uh, like magic or something like that, he, he ends up as this famous artist. This was, you know, Winfred was not always a good brother through his life. And the part that, that Natalie's talking about that brought me to tears, I mean, it just, I, I, I want to cry now is he's telling the story about um, this brother who took him in. A hard time, he took him in, he saw good in him, he wanted him to play basketball, and um, he stole that man's silver dollars. He stole the man's silver dollars. And that's, I, I, this is not me telling it, that's him telling it in, in his honesty. He, he's telling you the good with the bad. And he stole the silver dollars. He's in jail. Man didn't put him in. The wife called him. The, the man's wife called him. He's in jail. And the man shows up. 
at the trial and said, Your Honor, I must have made a mistake. I found my silver dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so they couldn't hold him in jail. He's in the car with the brother. And it, 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 this is a tale of not, this is not Winford, this is me. He's telling my tale that I'm too, I, I, I can't tell you all this stuff, okay? But he's telling the tale of me and he's telling the tale of, of so many other black boys who've been saved by people who saw something good. And he can't look at the man because he know he, he took the man's money, but he also know that he lied. He know that he lied and that's really hurting him. Even as a young boy, it's hurting him. The part that made me cry was that he talks about going back and he, you know, he, he just wanted Mr. Robinson. Mm -hmm. He wanted Mr. Robinson to know that he had changed. And so many of us, I don't care whether you're brothers, I don't care whether you're women, so many of us have done things when we were young and people stepped in and stood for us. They stood for us when, when, when no one else would stand for us. They stood for us. And that's what happened with Mr. Robinson. And the part that got me, Aaron, in this writing was he realized that he couldn't tell Mr. Robinson that he had changed because Mr. Robinson had gone. He had departed. That just brought me to my I mean, it just brought me to tears and I was crying like a baby because I could feel his pain. Mm -hmm. Winfrey left that story there so that I could feel that pain and so that we could use that to go on to teach other people uh, with that. Mm -hmm. So I, you're, I, not, I, I you're, not the only, you're not the only one that has cried over that. Every time Winfred talked about Mr. Robinson, which was Many times over the two years, he kind of returned to that moment. He cried. He cried every single I feel time. I he feel was so it. broken up about that. I feel him. I feel him because it represented not just Mr. Robinson. It represented all of the other bad that he had done, that he wanted to let folks know mm -hmm. that he had changed. Mr. Robinson was just a hallmark because he was early, early on and I, I understand. I, I could feel your husband, Patsy. Yeah, I could it feel bothered it. him a great deal. But yeah. I, I tried to assure him that Mr. Robinson knew that he had yeah. made a change. He said, well, I just, yeah. I just wanted him to see me changed. Mm -hmm. And what a family. You know, it really, it really got to him not to be able to say, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. It really got to him. <laughs> yeah. So, so again, folks, this is a book. We, we encourage you to light Troy's website up and go buy this book up and do it all um, because there are lessons and stories in here. Um, Malik, I don't know if you had other questions. I'm, I'm just going to ask Nat as soon as we can to move it along. But if you got other questions, go ahead. I didn't want to cut across you um, because maybe other things have come up for you as well. Right, right, right. Now I have a ton of questions. Um, I do want to get to the chat, but just just one observation, you know, on, on this point, on this um, part of his life that we're talking about, he was so young, it just struck me. I, I read the first few pages and then had to pause on it, just thinking about how he's 16 and 17 years old, not even saying he doesn't even know how he became the object. Uh, of attention to law enforcement. You know what I'm saying? And what he went through in while incarcerated, um, you know, being in that sweat box and, you know, it, it was a story no um, less horrible than you hear about enslavement in the, in the United States and how people were punished in enslavement. It's extraordinary that, that he, uh, uh, came of age as an adult being a human being, you know, with any feeling and compassion left in, in him, which again is what makes the art so remarkable, the relationship so remarkable. Um, Aaron, um, I don't know, do you, do you have anything you want to share about 
I mean, it, it's not a long, long text, actually, the book, you know, it's a, it's, it's a quick read. I mean, were there, there things, did you have to struggle with leaving things out or, you know, what stories to tell? Um, we didn't leave out thing, anything that Winfred felt he wanted people to know. So he, it was organized around the stories that were most important to him. Some of the details got left out and some themes that, um, you know, maybe he wasn't qu quite, quite ready to share were not developed as much, but um, it was, it really sort of came together in a way I think that he found satisfying and covered the things that he wanted to talk about. And I think it's just amazing that he was able to talk so openly and in such detail about some of these experiences and with the reflection of a mature person looking back, talking about what he went through and making sense of it in the context of his life as a whole and our society as a whole, like really thinking about it in a very sensitive and open way so that he could, so people could learn in a maybe deeper way about what he had been through. So it's not just the events, but you know, like his, his thinking that really interested me. And I thought he was amazing to be able to share all of those, you know, thoughts, you know, with me too. I like, who, who am I, you know, and I, and I'm such from such a different background and I'm asking him, you know, well, what did you think about when you went through these things and how do you feel about it now? And what do you want people to know? You know, and he was just always so welcoming of the opportunity to develop and share his thoughts on those. He never made me feel awkward for asking these questions and asking him to explain, you know, because he wanted to think about these things more and, you know, kind of just maybe come to some, some sense of um, just meaningfulness in some of these experiences that were, you know, that just caused such despair. Um, so I appreciated that greatly. So one of the questions that's in the chat, um, and I'm just going to read the whole thing really quickly, but it says, Mr. Rembert's art came out of personal trauma while witnessing and surviving horrific acts of systemic racism. The impact of Mr. Rembert's art on me and others can only be called profound and humbling. Did the work bring Mr. Rembert peace? And I would ask, in addition to that, did the book bring him peace? Like, was it? cathartic for him. You're asking me or Aaron? Either one of you all. Well, I think it brought him a sense of um, fulfillment in the sense that he accomplished what he set out to do. Mm -hmm. He accomplished what he asked the Lord to allow him to do. And he held no kind of animosity toward people. He only had love. And that's the strange thing about it. He loved everybody. He didn't have no picking and choosing. He loved everybody. He wanted to be loved. He, he wanted to be loved by everybody. But he also wanted people to know that there was things that was happening to uh, uh, Blacks at that time and today that was unjust. Where's the justice in all this? That was the most that he wanted out of the book. And he was hoping that by doing the book, people can see how life was truly for black men and what all they had to suffer through and that it would help in some way of changing the mindset. But it's most things, I don't know how, he, he just didn't hold no animosity in his heart. He had only love for everybody and he wanted to be loved by everybody. He, 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 that's what he wanted. And that's the way he raised his children, not to hold animosity towards any race of people because of what had happened, but to learn from it and treat people on an individual basis and in what they may have done and you have done, but not to hold a whole race of people accountable for what went on. How he was able to feel that way, I don't know, but that's the way he felt. 
I'll just add, I don't think it resolved the trauma that he suffered. You know, it might have been cathartic in some ways, but he he did suffer from the trauma throughout his life, which is one of the reasons we decided to call the book Chasing Me to My Grave. Some of these um, these traumatic experiences, you know, would, would haunt him in his dreams and wake him up at night. Um, and it didn't, doing the art was an important way to um, express, you know, maybe externalize, maybe gain some kind of control over some of these feelings, but I don't think that it resolved the trauma um, that he struggled with. No, not in no way did it stop it. But at the same time, that's what was so hard to understand, for me to understand, was that he suffered from in his dreams, but when he's awake and alert, he held no uh, animosity toward anybody. He would talk about it and explain it, and he would tell me, because I'm there with him when he wake up sometime, he'd be fighting in his sleep, trying to get away and trying to save himself. And he said, you know, I don't think I'm gonna ever truly be over this. I think they're gonna chase me to my grave. And they did. Wow. He never, never got over that part. But the part that amazes me is that he didn't hold no animosity toward any race of people for. He didn't hate anybody. That's what I couldn't understand. I, I think I'd hate. I'd be angry because I'm angry to happen to him, not me. And I was angry about it. Right. And I was hurt by it just to hear what had happened to him. I wanted to do something. I wanted to do something literally violent, but he didn't. That's the part that I don't understand. I just couldn't understand it. You know, that, that makes me think, you know, this also, as I mentioned earlier, is the story of migration, of the out-migration from the South, um, uh, especially uh, in, in this period in the 21st century where we go from legal segregation and Jim Crow, you know, to, um, to a change in that. Patsy, can you talk about how um, moving north change your life or not? Or, you know, did that make a difference in um, Winfred's perspective? Um, you all, you know, relocating up north? Well, we relocated up north because that's where he could find the work that he felt like he could take care of his children. That we was, one, we had planned to have 10, you know, but uh, it worked out that way. We stopped at eight. But that was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was the plan. And he didn't want them to get a sense of, you know, people that farm, they love it. And I didn't either. He didn't want them to get a sense of that kind of life. He wanted them to have a different type of life. And uh, you can't do it if you live in the South. You're automatically being hooked on working in the fields and all. He didn't want that for his children. Right. So moving north, was, that was the reason. But the love of Georgia in the places and the openness never left either one of us. But the lifestyle, we come north in order for our children, hopefully to have a better outlook on life yeah. and have a better interest in different things. So that was the reason for coming north. Thank you. So there's a question about the picture that's behind you. So they wanna know what's, what's the name of the piece and they wanna know a little bit about it. Uh, that's a curve, they call it the curvy. That's what he called it, the curvy. It was a place where when kids are not in school, they go in, uh, or when they're playing hooky from school, they would go and swim in that hole. And that's where they'd all hang out at, the curvy. That was one of his favorite places he said he would go. He couldn't really go to school, so they had a place where they'd go and meet. And just jump off in that hole and swim around. 
in terms of his process, and this is for Patsy, and he talked about, I think a little bit in the book, people are asking like, how many times did he put it on paper before he put it on the leather? Oh, he put it on paper one time. Wow. And, and, and from that, he did his sketching, but now that's where he would finalize it is on paper, but he only wrote it once. Mm. How he done that, I don't know either. But when he went to the leather, it was finished for him. That's this is what I'm gonna do. Wow. I have all of uh, most of all of the uh initial drawings okay. of a lot of the paintings. I got all of the the first drawing, but he, he he's sketching his mind, he could do that, and then he would automatically just start. If you would see him work, it would, it would, it, it's amazing how you do things. You get to start and just keep going until you have a finished product. And it really depended on what he wanted to do and how he wanted to do it. Uh, he'd sketch it out in his mind. That's, at least that's what he told me. He would sketch it in his mind. He would see it like a photograph. Then he would start to put it down. Because he didn't have nobody to look at to do it. So. He had uh, taken a picture of it. So had he reached a point where he was able to be a full-time artist? Like, was he working, you know, because this is like the dilemma that some artists have is they got to work, you know, and then they, they do their passion, which is their art on the side. What was going on throughout the process of doing the paintings and then what was going on in, in the other half of his life? Was he ever able to be a full-time artist that would support the family? Well, in the ending part of his life, when he reached in his 60s, 70s, you know, early 70s, 60s, he, uh, he never stopped trying to do something, but he was not able physically to keep working. As long as he possibly could, he worked. The art would just have to take a back seat to that because he didn't think anybody wanted anything he'd done anyway. But... Uh, he became uh, more of an artist after Yale said, gave him the show and told him that he was an artist. Mm. So whatever year that was, that's when it was. I can't even tell you the year, but it had to be 2000 and what, two? I think it was 2000. 2000? Yeah, somewhere along in there. And that's when he really started to think of himself as an artist. Wow. He, get, he got confirmation from Yale that you got good work. And he was so proud. Oh my God, that look on his face. I love him so much. He was so proud that Yale thought enough of him to give him a show and to show his work and say that Jock Miller said, you artist. And that was just wonderful for him. Wow. Okay, so one other question here about his activism. They asked whether and how much of an activist was he and did, does his activism show up in his work? I think it is, but you can answer. <laughs> you know, um, well, he, 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 he's been always outspoken about things, you know, he, he never, he had a way of doing it that would, uh, in his, when they would give him seminars to do. He could put it in the seminars where people would question themselves about whether or not they was prejudiced or whether or not this was right or not. He just had a way about it. I wished we had taped all of his uh, shows that he did, you know, uh, because they was very interesting to see how he would pull people in to check themselves about racism what they thought of another person because of his color or because of where you thought he came from. What do you really truly think of this person? And when you say you have a black friend, what are you talking about? It shouldn't be a color, that's my friend. Why would you label it, that's my black friend? You know, he had questions like that that he would bring up in his seminars and he would have people questioning themselves because 90% was white. So he had a white audience that he was teaching 
about racism where they didn't know they was race racist in the sense that that oh I got a black friend he said right there says you racist because you trying to get me to convince that you got a black friend that's not the way you do it he had an answer I'm not articulate like he would be but I just wish that we had taped all of his uh, seminars. But he was very active on the front with, with uh, equal justice. And he would talk about it openly. He just was unable to participate as much as he might have wanted to because of his health. But if he had to stand up for something, he would. He, he'd done a lot of things that, uh, I mean, he didn't ask for a crowd to do what he wanted to do. He do it himself and see how it come out. I'm going to give you one instance, and then you can take it wherever you want to take it. But I'm going to tell you this. It's a place that we go fishing, right? And you can only fish there if you are uh, a resident. And the guy came to tell us that we had to go. He said, no, I'm not going. I want you to arrest me and take me to jail. So I can tell everybody why I can't fish here. It's not because I don't live in the area. He said, I live in the United States of America. And you go and get people from other countries and bring in, they free to fish anywhere they want to. But I've been here. My folks have died here and been in wars for you, but I can't fish here. He said, no, arrest me. I'm not leaving. Guess what he done? He left. But he stood that day on a moral ground that I got a right to be here. And you're not going to use that old time thing with me. I got to be a resident. But he said, you might as well put up a sign and say white only. The guy got in his truck. He was a horse ranger. He got in his truck and pulled off. He didn't come back. But he let him know, you're not going to trick me with saying, because I'm not a resident, I can't fish you. Just put up a sign that said, white on, like he used to. Mm. Got left. Because that's all what he felt that it meant. Wow. So I don't, that's, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're getting comments and people are so inspired by you. And people are saying, you're articulating all of this just fine. So for you to say, you know, you can't do it that way, you are definitely having an impact on our audience. So I, I do want to share that because I'm looking at that, that over I'm there. Bringing, you are beautiful. This is wonderful. What he would want me to say and how. Well, I'm glad we're recording this. Um, we're going to probably get, we're getting close to almost wrapping up. Um, Paul or Malaika, is there anything else you want to do to, to close? Um, at this point, or what would be your preference? I, the only thing I have left to say is just to echo the comment about uh, um, Patsy and, and, and her insight and her contribution to you know, Winfred's life, this book, and this conversation. And, you know, and as I said to her earlier, I found enormous wisdom in what you had to say in the book and in what you have to say now, you know. Um, so I know you're speaking on behalf of your husband's legacy, but I think you have a, an important legacy as well. And, and so I thank you for that. I thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to come around um, the same way. We, um, and I, I think I've done this several times, and that is uh, thanking Aaron and um, thanking Patsy. You know, the one thing that keep coming back to me, Patsy, what keep coming back to me is how you told your husband, ain't nobody else doing this. Now, the, now the amazing thing about it is you're right. <laughs> you know, like, like, but you had not been to art schools around the world. You know, you had not been <laughs> engaged in um, 
um, who's who in art and all those kinds of things. You've not been going to art auctions, but what you were saying was right because what you were saying was other people may have skills and what have you, but nobody, well, first of all, nobody got that experience like you got it. And nobody is putting this into their work. I mean, just the honesty and the originality of it. So your vision, and it wasn't like you told him this once, you told him this multiple times. Oh, wow. <laughs> he, he, like, like some men, not me, all right? Not me. Like some men, they have a hard time listening to women. I always listen to women, OK? OK. <laughs> so, so don't worry about that. All right. All right. If, you, if you had told me, I would have just went and done it. Okay. 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 I got you. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, you knew. You knew, and 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 what you were saying was so true. And once he heard it, once he did hear it, mm -hmm. he knew yeah. what you were saying was true. And he went on to create a legacy that's really, really unique in our tradition and unique in, I don't know, I, I don't know how what he does shows up in other traditions. I really don't. So, I mean, you, 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 you called this one, girl. You, you, I mean, you called this, all right? You called it before anybody else saw it, before anybody else knew it. You were calling the shot on this one. And that just blows my mind. I'm blown away by the art, but I'm also blown away by the fact that you knew and you could inspire him and direct him in this direction. Mm -hmm. So I thank you. I, I'm I'm just like impressed. Just totally, totally, totally impressed. Thank you. I, I do want to do a, a shout out also because you you referenced Phil and and phil's wife and and for folks on this call uh, when you get the book you'll know for folks who don't get the book she's speaking of the mcblains mm -hmm. and many people on this call know the mcblains as as antiquarian book dealers mm -hmm. can you talk about that patsy because obviously they were very early and instrumental in terms of um Phil especially and 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 your husband spoke spoke about him uh, like he felt like a brother. He did. So you can, know, can you talk about them just a little, please? Yes. It was not about art. That was right. never in the plan. That come up later. We was mm -hmm. friends long before that come because we both deal with children. Mm -hmm. And Sharon was kind enough because things was tough, and Phil took over the. Uh, they became fast friends too. And that's not easy with being friends with Phil, but Winford and Phil hit it off right away. They became friends. Phil would take Winford shopping and get extra food for us to have in the house. And Sharon and I was dealing with children, uh, disadvantaged children and stuff. And so we just became friends. But Phil actually sold Wimple's first picture out of his shop. Wimple had gave it to him for and gave him the money for it. So it was a long process. And then he would take Wimple to go shopping and buy more leather to do more work. So it was a, a long, but it was a joyous time that we had with the McBlains. And it came about long before the artwork did. Mm -hmm. So we didn't become friends with the art. We was friends before. Mm -hmm. And friend and Sharon and, and, and uh, Phil took a great interest in our children and to help us in any way they could. So that's, that's been great. a long standing friendship. And then that's we great. just all collaborated on the art when we finally figured out what we could really do. See, I'm finding this out along with them too. <laughs> so we was looking for an avenue and that was the avenue that I said the Lord took us down mm -hmm. to uh, the art and that he could do it on leather because nobody else was doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of collaboration. 
so 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 Nat, I know we're getting ready to wrap up. Can I? Um, uh, I don't know if you're getting more questions in, but I'm gonna I'm gonna ask if I can get one more in here, because we we we're, we're looking at Patsy, and we and again I'm celebrating this woman. I'm gonna give y'all one more thing to celebrate. So this brother comes off the chain gang. He goes up to uh, Connecticut. He's struggling. He starts selling drugs. He gets arrested. He goes to jail. He's in jail. Patsy out there with the children. I want to know how many of y'all know a woman that walk in on the judge and tell the judge. <laughs> tell, tell the judge to let her man out of jail. And the judge said, okay. <laughs> Can you talk about that, Patsy? <laughs> oh, yes. I, I explained to him that this man done did everything he could to get a job. He done done everything, and folks telling him he overqualified. Uh, uh, and he already know that it's because he's Black. He's a terrific. Uh, he didn't go to school for it, but he learned it on the chain gang. Heavy equipment operator. Operate in it, bulldozer, uh, uh, backhoe. And the guy was looking for a foreman, but he told him, you're, you too qualified. And things like that was happening to him. I said, he, was, he done did everything he know how to do to get a job. And we got a lot of children. I said, and he's trying to take care of him. He only did six months. Everybody else was doing 12, 13 years. They let him go. <laughs> six months. But I walked in there and I told him, you got to let him go. I need him. We got six boys. Two girls, and uh, he decided he let him go. He said, "Long as you stay here, nobody's gonna bother you." So we stayed right here in Connecticut, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the end of that. Wow. That was the end of that. But I did. I went in there, and I I spoke my mind about it. And I'm saying, you know, he even went to the mayor to try to get a job. I said, "Nobody get my job. He got to take care. He got to live." Gotta live. What do you expect him to do when somebody standing over and saying, hey, well, you can work for me and I'll give you X amount of dollars? That's what he thought he had to do. Mm -hmm. So they let him go. Right. They let him go. All right. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna be quiet now after this. You got any more questions? Are we ready to wrap up? Because I would yeah. tell y'all, I would tell y'all in the book too. Aaron, I'll tell the whole book, okay? If I was on here all night, I'll tell y'all Patsy got out in the street and started fighting y'all because she's fighting for her kids. She fighting for her kids out in that street. That whole family got out there fighting in the street. This is more than a book on art, y'all. Yeah, it's so autobiographical. Like, I didn't get it. Like, when I first looked at the artwork, I thought, wow, this is interesting artwork. But then in reading the book and the pictures, I'm like, this is just autobiographical. Like, this isn't somebody else's life and somebody else's stuff. And this is his life. And it's, it is it's, it is so much more. And somebody commented on, on there that they had bought the book. They got it, I think, from the library. They finished reading it this morning. And I think they said they're going to put on buying lots more so that they can give to people. So this is, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful book. It's a beautiful book. It's a beautiful story. And it's told very beautifully in his words. And so, yes, um, I think we are because we're at 734 okay. Eastern time. Um, before we go, I do want to do a couple other acknowledgments. I want to acknowledge um, the folks who are from, you know, who've helped make this book possible. I want to acknowledge um, Sally McCartan, who is on the call. I don't know if she's going to come off screen again. And we also have Stephanie. Now, I'm going to pronounce your name wrong. Steiker. OK, she's, she's giving me a thumbs up that I did that. And so I want to thank you all for being with us tonight. I hope this was enjoyable for you as all. We really appreciate the opportunity to share this with our audience. You know, we don't always do books that we don't publish, but it's, it's definitely been a pleasure um, doing this book. I also, oh, oh, there's Sally. Sally, is there anything you want to say? No, she's just waving. Okay. <laughs> okay, Sally. All right. Sally has also worked with us on a couple other books that we've done. So it's been, a, we've, we've had her around for a long, long time. Um, I want to thank Books and Beyond Book Club out of Florida, Harlem's Literary Society, Oracle Set Book Club in DC. They are always here. Thank you very much. And then also, I don't know if he's still on, but we also had Emery Douglas 
y'all who is on the phone who is an artist as well all that panther that black panther art that you see that's emory douglas y'all so i i it's, know it's, it's, it's can we check to see if Emory emory is still here i'd be very it curious looks like he is still here emory if you could come off of mute please at least it says that that he's still on with us emory if you could come off of mute and say something that would be great uh oh uh oh here we go here we go there we go and and, and emory i know you don't like being put on the spot that much but you know i could not help but read this and think about your powerful work and i just wonder if you can i wonder if you can just say a few words and i know i'm putting you on the spot but it's okay comrade you know we go back we, we comrades okay. well uh I, it was uh heartwarming to hear Patsy tell the story it mm -hmm. was uh it was like listening to my family and them talking mm -hmm. and about the challenges and on mm -hmm. life's journey it was it was very powerful and and, and and a lot of things I had done always had been reflection of books and stuff that I had looked at that dealt with the, the struggles and situations of the chain game in the south and what have you and also what I count with the party Panthers who were in uh, in, in Angola who were left chain game you know. so I, it's, it's, it was it was uh, it brought back a lot of memories in in many ways mm -hmm. uh, uh, personal memory of growing up. Yeah. Emory Douglas, thank you so much. You've given so much and just to have you um, comment and to be here on the call with us. We're honored, brother. Thank you. He does. Emory also has a beautiful book out, y'all. And I, I, I wish I had known you were going to be here because I probably would have had it next to me, but I love that book. So he also has one. Um, are there are two editions of that out now. Or maybe oh, there's a second edition, yeah. Yeah, so there's a second. I'm not in print anymore right now. Yeah. So you got to look up Emory too. We got to love our black artists, y'all. We have to. Yeah, so. what, em, Emory, Emory, can you share the title that we're talking about, please? Yeah, it's called uh, Black Panther: The Revolutionary Art of Emory Douglas. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Got it. Thank you, Thank Paul. You. That was that was very smart of you to. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> I could remember. Just tell the title. Thank you, Paul. All right. <laughs> Uh, and I want the two more things that I want to share before we get off. I want to, of course, thank everyone who came out tonight. I want to thank everybody who, who came together to make this, this happen. Um, it is always a pleasure seeing so many people, you know, joining us. I want to thank our production team. I want to thank, thank Janine. I want to thank Damani and I want to thank Roz Coates because they are in the background they're the ones letting y'all in. They're the ones monitoring the questions. And I have to especially thank all of them for being here today because I got to relax. If y'all saw me, I was like this a lot of times because I got to enjoy the call. So I appreciate them. Uh, this is like, we've been on the phone with each other all day. So I appreciate every single one of you all. I want to thank Malaika and Aaron. And of course, Miss Patsy, I have to thank all of you all. Um, and the thank last Gaza again for me, please. Because oh, absolutely. She, she always her. responds to my last minute. <laughs> Sister Mugazi, you know I just love you. So thank you for clearing the space for us. Thank you for allowing the ancestor to be present. Um, thank you for blessing this call. So thank you so much. Absolutely. She's like one of our production team members because she's always here and she's always going to make it happen. So I thank her as well. Um, one note, y'all, we got a new book that's going to be coming out in November. Speaking of activists, we have a book um, about Florence L. Tate, who was an activist. And um, there's a memoir. And I'm going to tell you, we've been trying to bring this thing out for a couple of years. We have worked hard on it. It is a beautiful book. Um, it's, oh my good, here, wait a minute. Let me see if I can do this real quick. I want to show you all the cover of this book, if I can, because this is the cover of this book. And it's called Sometimes Farm Girls Become Revolutionaries, Notes on Black Power, Politics, Depression, and the FBI. It's a beautiful book. There's notes in there that, that she wrote from her journal. There's pieces from um, her files, her FBI files in there. There's notes from friends. It's just been a beautiful piece to pull together. And so you will hear more about that coming up. But in this November is when we plan on releasing that. I'm sure we're going to have a call about it. <laughs> so I look forward to that. But I, 
you know, uh, encourage you all to, to, to look forward to that because it's another great, great, great read. Very good. And, uh, just another quick plug. We also just finished um, Andrew Billingsley, Institution Build, Scholar Institution Builder. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that more. Uh, one of our next phone calls will be with Dr. Billingsley, who is still with us and still blessing us. He's 93, 94, I think, this year. So, so we're going to have some great times as we go forward. All right, y'all. I think that we are going to call it a wrap for this Sunday evening. Again, I thank you Be so before much. Before we do that, can we thank Molly Eka again, too? Yay, Molly Eka. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. This is good. This is good. Um, can I just yeah. mention quickly that if that there will be an exhibit of Winford's art in New York City opening mm -hmm. on October 7th, running through De December 8th. So any of you who are in the New York area um, in during that period, you can see his work on display at a gallery called Port Gansevoort. Okay. Uh, and then can, can we get Patsy the last word going out? Yeah, so so let me do this before Patsy goes out. And I will let her have the last word. Okay. I'll, I'll shut it down right after she finishes <laughs> in this call. The other thing is that, um, oh, now I lost my track. This, will, this is being recorded. So for those of you who are on here, you will receive an email and we'll have it posted on our website as well. It'll be on our YouTube channel. So you will be able to get this and share it with others and tell them what they missed tonight because they did miss a treat. So with that, those are my last words. Miss Patsy, you get to close us out. I'd just like to thank y'all for having me and for presenting his book and his art and to talking about his life. I thank you very much. I thank you all. And hope to join in and talk with you again at some point. Let's do it. All right. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Oh my God. I think. So usually we try to clear the room and then we just do a little wrap up ourselves. Um, but uh, it's, clo it's closed out pretty well. I think Paul already signed off. So I'll, ask, I'll text Paul and ask him to sign back in. And, um, and that's just a close out. Let's see. Hopefully we don't have to. Thank you all for coming. You can leave. probably people who have left so I may all right so why don't we just um I oh, know it's clearing Janine you did a great job tonight oh thank you no it's wonderful oh I feel like I mean this could be like February part two. Oh well we'll have we have um, a couple of the books that are supposed to be out like in January, February, we've got a COINTELPRO book that's coming out. Um, it's a reprint. And then we also have um, Agents of Repression by the same person. So I'm going to, I'm just going to end this and then we'll, and then just come back into your link. Okay. Come back into right. the link. Okay. Yeah. All right.